Presentation Skills for Design Students, Episode 34. Are you a design student or graduate who wants to succeed in the professional world? If so, keep listening. You are about to discover how to get noticed, land your dream job, and have a crazily successful career. It's all about being able to speak, present, and communicate like a boss. So let's get to it. Hello, design peeps, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Christina Cantors, and today I am thrilled to be chatting to the very charming Nick Gray, the founder of Museum Hack, which is the coolest tour company you'll ever encounter. Today, we'll be talking about how do you get a job at a small company? Now, as the owner of a young, fun, and super innovative company, a lot of people get in touch with Nick wanting to work with work for him, but only a very select few actually land a job, which is really common in most small businesses, including design firms. So today, Nick and I are talking about how do you get a job at a small firm? How are small companies different to large firms? How to get your foot in the door and the simple way to stand out from the hordes of other job applicants. You can find show notes for this episode at designdrawspeak.com slash 034. Before we get into the interview, I just want to give a quick shout out to some amazing listeners who have left iTunes reviews. Yay! This first one is from Handet. I hope I'm saying that right. And Handet says, Christina is a very down-to-earth person who has everyone's intentions at heart. I am also an architecture student who thinks in a similar manner to her, which is very refreshing. Many of her episodes have a lot of useful information that I will use in my school career. And I just have one more here uh, from Princess Riri from New Zealand. And Princess Riri says, I love your weekly challenges. I'm not a design student, but finding your tips on communicating have helped me on a day-to-day basis. Thanks. Thank you, Princess Riri. I really appreciate it. Your everyone who leave for everyone who leaves a review, I just I really appreciate all your support. It just means a lot. Okay, without further ado, let's jump into the interview with Nick Gray from Museum Hack on how to stand out, beat the competition, and land one of those elusive jobs in a small company. Nick Gray, Museum Hacker entrepreneur and all-around cool guy. Welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for joining me. I am excited to be here. Thank you. Fair disclosure, I'm trying to make the best ever podcast. This is the first time I've ever done a podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. Yeah, first ever podcast. I have Uh, no doubt you're going to be awesome. Would you be able to share with us a bit about Museum Hack, Nick, and and what led you to starting it? Yes, I will talk about that. First, I want to say I do not come from a museum background. If you heard that we do museum stuff and you immediately tuned out, (laughs) I am with you. (laughs) Um, I used to hate museums. I thought that they were the most boring places in the world. I said, these paintings have nothing to do with me. My feet hurt. I don't like this place. Get me out of here. And then about three years ago, I had this transformative, amazing experience this woman brought me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art that's here in New York City. It's our largest museum. Um, and she took me there on a romantic date. Oh. It was, I know, it was awesome. It was our third date, and she was, like, showing me around, and it was late at night. And it was that experience of having someone talk to me about pieces that they were excited about or maybe it was just because it was a really attractive woman who was actually talking to me. (laughs) But that for me was an awesome experience. It got me really excited about museums and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I started to go back there a lot to explore. It unlocked a sense of curiosity about history and antiquities that I never had. I decided a year later for my birthday, I would become a tour guide for my friends. I started to do tours at the Met. They were first called Hack the Met. Um, And I did these for fun and for free just because I loved it. And about a year and a half ago, I was able, or a little more than a year ago, I was able to quit my job. I now do this full time. Um, We have about 12 
employees and we lead renegade tours at museums across the world. Actually, we're just in New York now, but I wanted to make us sound bigger than we were. <laughs> well, you've got 12 people working for you and it's only been a year since you've been doing this full time. It's only been a year. I have to give credit to them. A lot of them are hustlers in their own right. And so they work for us on a part-time basis. Um, most of our tours do take place on the weekends and that allows them to have other jobs. Mm. Well, that's incredible. And I, I'm, I gotta say, I have done a tour with Museum Hack and that's where I met Nick. Actually, I did a tour at the Met and it was totally awesome. And the way that Nick and the other guides were explaining this art to me and making it really fun and interesting, I just thought, I gotta get him on the podcast because I too am not that big a fan of museums. And to be honest, I probably would not have gone to the Met if it wasn't for your tour. So. Oh. So thank you. For so saying thank that. you. <laughs> you are our target audience. You know, there's a lot of people that I meet who say, "Oh, I love museums. I go there all the time." I'm like, "That's awesome. You do not need my company." <laughs> um, because I am more interested in those people who never go to museums. I'm interested in those people who are like, "Oh, museums are boring. I don't want to go there." We get people excited about museums who don't like them. Mm. And we say, if you have a good time on one of our tours, hopefully you'll come back and develop your own relationship with the museum. Yeah. If anyone's in New York City, definitely go check them out. Anyway, Nick, the reason I wanted to speak with you on the podcast today was because you are a small business owner and you've had to go about hiring people to work for you. And I just wanted to talk today about if someone is a graduate and they want to work for a small company like yours, but a potentially a design company or something like that, what can they do in order to get hired, get their foot in the door? Because oftentimes these sorts of jobs are not advertised. But first, I just want to ask, how is a small business different to a large company? Yes, I would love to talk about this. How is a small business different from a large company? First, I should state that working at a small business is not for everyone. Uh, small businesses are confusing, they are disorganized, they are uh, fast-paced, they are hectic, uh, sometimes there's no clear goals, and yet for all those negatives, they can also be incredibly fun and dynamic and fast-paced. You and I were talking before, can you talk about how you get to see more of a project at a small business? Yeah, so with a with an architecture firm, uh, I, I know for sure in, when you're working for a smaller company, you get to see more of the process as opposed to just working on one tiny little part of, of one huge project. So in a large firm, you might be stuck working on toilets for six months and never actually get to see the entire building. But with smaller projects and smaller firms, you, you get a more holistic experience, which is really great. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You get to touch all aspects of a project. And we do that at my business. It can involve someone like a museum educator who we hire to do a tour and they're used to just being handed a script and say, okay, now go work on this script in these galleries. We don't even say that. We say, look, here is your goal make people have fun in the museum. Now you develop everything, build your route, build the pieces. Um, our tour guides are amazing and they do so much for us. We just kind of set a little bit of the framework. Um, I have to say that working at a small business is not for everyone. And what we're going to talk about today is how to work at one. If you are looking for an incredible amount of job security and amazing health care and retirement and all these other <laughs> fancy things, you may not find that at a small business. Mm. Um, but I believe that a lot of the job advice out there now today is about how to work at large companies. And I th I'm pretty sure the number one employer is small business. That's where all the new job growth is happening, at least in New York City. Mm. Um, so I'd love to just brainstorm about how people could get jobs, how to get their foot in the door, things like that. Okay. Okay. Can we start off talking about that then, getting your foot in the door? Yes. You did a really <laughs> good job of that with 
reaching out to me. You made this awesome YouTube video. How did you come up with that idea? People who have been following this podcast will, will know that I like to make videos to ask people to be guests on my podcast. And I made a video for Nick and I basically paid homage to his About Me video um, on the, the About page on museumhack.com. And yeah, yeah I just kind of did a spoof video and sent it to him and and he said, yes, yeah, so that's how I got my my foot in the door. I suppose like, that's how I got your attention anyway. That was awesome what you did because you took the initiative and I wasn't like reaching out and being like, I want to talk on podcasts. Like you, you said, look, you searched me out. You made a creative video to cut through the email clutter, right? Small business owners get at least 50 to 100 email messages a day. Probably the worst thing you can do if you're applying at a small business is send somebody your resume right. on email as a file attachment. I mean, that's the last, yeah. Uh, so, we'll so, go into if, that so, if someone, if someone <laughs> said, so if someone sends you an email saying, oh, hey, I'd love to work for your company, please see my CV attached, would you even bother opening it? Short answer, no. I never look at people's resumes when they send them an email. Long answer, I have so much respect for people that are searching for jobs. I want to say that I sympathize with you and while many of the things that I will say could sound harsh or kind of critical, the reality is that I get some weeks up to 10 random emails with people who want to work for us or who are sending something in at job fairs. When we go to a job fair, I'll I'll meet more than a hundred people all at once. These sort of tips, you need to find something that will get you to cut through the clutter, to be, to add value to the small business owner. And it starts with trying to get your foot in the door. Um, when you send a file attachment of your resume, that for me, it's just, I mean, it's put you in the frame of mind of, oh, this person is looking for a job. This person like wants to take something from me. Okay. Now, can we just can we just expand on that? If for someone to get their foot in the door, what would they have to do? There's two ways uh that I think about that come to mind. Number 1 is to immediately add value or number 2 is to ask very gently for a specific question or piece of advice. And it has to be highly targeted. Um but the first one adding value to somebody's business has a financial bottom line, right? You're kind of like playing to the bottom line to the marketing. The second one of asking highly targeted advice plays to the small business owner's ego. Ooh, uh, I like that. Cause, yeah, because everybody loves to give advice. This has to be a genuine question that you have. It can't be like, oh, I'm just trying to like play to, to, to their ego. But as a minor example is if I was talking to you, Christina, I may ask you, how, hey, how do you record these podcasts? You know, when you travel, what type of audio equipment do you use? And I'm willing to bet that you genuinely want to talk about that because you have a vested interest. Yeah, in that. for sure. Um, with a small business owner, somebody reached out to me a, a few weeks ago and they said, I'm thinking of going to a master's program. I know that I want to be doing what you are doing or what your employees are doing. How do I get there through this master's program? And I felt so passionate about that. I actually met up with this person for a cup of coffee. I tried to give her some advice. That is something that I, I usually never do. That if someone were to just reach out to me and be like, hey, I want to work for you. Can we meet up for coffee? I'm not going to make time in my schedule for that. But I felt very strongly about master's programs and things like that. So I did meet up with her for coffee. So that's the one where you kind of ask people for advice. Um, but the one about adding value, my thought would be that uh, you would make something very gently and very quickly, but that would take maybe half an hour, an hour to test their appetite to see if they're receptive to this type of work. Um, and what I mean by that is, let's take example. Right now, my company is doing something called an all-day hack, 
where we are doing an all-day museum hack. We're going from the Metropolitan Museum of Art to the American Museum of Natural History, seven hours of museums. And if you were to look at our Twitter account, you would see that we're trying to market and promote this. And yet we don't have any cool graphics for it or anything like that. If someone reached out to me and made a cool graphic and was like, hey, I saw you're trying to promote this. Check it out. I made this graphic for you. <laughs> That's cool. Like, I would look at that. I would be super thankful. And then I wouldn't even ask them for anything when you send that. I would wait for them to reply back and see, do they write back? Are they like, thank you so much? And if they do write back, then in your reply to that message is where you could do an ask. Be like, hey, I want to um, learn more about your company or I want to see if I could help you out more. Could we have a quick phone call or something? Wow. That's showing initiative, that's showing passion, and that's showing that you're willing to stand out and think outside the box and just do things a little bit differently. And that's going to get your attention. Yeah. There's been, I know in the design community, and you may be able to speak about this more than I can, but I think there's been a backlash against spec work. And maybe this is just like in the graphic design community, or there's another term, but spec work is the idea that when a company puts out a pitch or a bid, they want you to do free work for them. And there's been this huge backlash where people say, no spec work, it is unethical. Um, and yet what I'm saying is like flip the script a little bit. Do a little bit of spec work when people aren't even asking for it. Yes. Um, and that's, that's the foot in the door that you're looking for because a lot of these jobs that you'll be looking for with small business owners are not even posted. They're not being posted online. The job that you want possibly doesn't even exist yet. I, would, I, I really like this point that you make, Nick, and I would like everyone to really think about this and really let that sink in. Okay, small companies are not going to be advertising. It's, it's often when uh, someone comes up or they find someone who is really good then they, they think, yeah, you know, maybe we do need someone. Maybe we could use this person. I actually have a, an example of this. When um, I went to London when I was doing my work experience year as part of my architecture course and I came across an architecture firm that was advertising for a secretary and I thought, oh, well, I can do secretary work and then, you know, we'll see what happens. So I walked in there, I got an interview on the spot and I was hired the next day as their secretary. And after two weeks, I said to them, look, I really need to be doing architecture work. It's part of my degree. Um, if you can't offer me architecture work, I'm going to have to look somewhere else. And they said, oh, well, you know what? We could actually do with some architecture help. So why don't you work and do some architecture uh, work and we'll just hire a new secretary. And that was, and they didn't advertise for that job. They weren't even thinking about it. And it's only because I happened <laughs> to be there and asked for it and they gave it to me. So that's another way of getting your foot in the door. <laughs> that is awesome. Nice work. You did. You did the old bait and switch uh -huh. <laughs> secretary to full-time job position. Yeah. I think that's a great thing is it's this idea of being willing to start out and say, look, I just want to help you out and let me just prove to you that I'm a good worker. I will say that you have to be careful about this because what you did, Christina, was you went into this saying, I am willing to do secretary work. You maybe didn't start out saying, hey, I'm doing this, but, but I hate secretary work, right? No, I didn't, tell, I didn't tell them that I was intending on doing architecture work eventually. I just said, no, look, I'm happy to apply for the job as a secretary. It just happens yeah. to be in an architecture firm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> can we talk about how people can really impress you as a small business owner because I know you've probably gone to lots of networking events and job fairs and things like that what what really impresses you as a small business owner that would make you go you know I want to get to know this person more or, or even I want to hire this person okay that's a really good question what would it take to really impress me I think that you have to realize, especially when someone has posted for a job that they are hiring for, you are competing against sometimes hundreds of other people. At least if you're in a major metropolitan city, you're competing with so many people. 
for me to say, oh, this person's really interested. I give you an example. I went to a job fair a few months ago and we were meeting a bunch of students who were either current students or they had just graduated in the design field. And I saw over a hundred students over a couple of hours and everybody had their resume and everybody came up to me saying, I want a job like this. I need a job like this. I'm looking for a job like this. And not a single person asked me, what can I help you with? Or wow. what do you need? Yeah, nobody, nobody asked me. Not a single person. Everybody came to me saying, I want, I need, I'm good at this. And I can respect that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but if I'm seeing a hundred people, it becomes a broken record of people that are asking me for things and it, it becomes a liability to me. Versus if someone would have come up to me and said, um, what do you need help with? Like, you know, forget what are you hiring for? Mm -hmm. Forget what are your current job openings? You're trying to get them off of the script a little bit to say like, where is your pain point? Mm -hmm. And this is real talk. I mean, you, you may not have the skills that somebody needs, right? For my pain point right now, and this is just sharing with you, my pain point largely lies on the sales side. Um, we're trying to grow the sales of our business, and so I'm particularly looking for sales aspects. But it's about trying to, at least at a job fair, get the recruiter or get the small business owner away from the standard script that they're doing with every single other person and say, where is your pain point? Like, what, what is it that you are struggling with? And do I have anything in there that could help? Because at, as you may be found, the, 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 the pain point at the architectural firm was they needed a receptionist. That's where the pain point started. Yes. And you were able to come in and say, I can immediately help you with that and then grow in your responsibilities. Mm. I don't know. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And imagine that if you could be the one person out of hundreds of people who actually ask that, I mean, that's instantly going to make you more memorable. And it just, co it just yeah. comes back to when, even when you're having a conversation with, with someone, just, just any, any time, if you show interest in them and you ask them questions and you, and, you're happy, and you listen to them and you show that you're listening and you respond and, and show that you can help, that's, gonna, that's just going to help you in any life situation. So, you know, this is, you can, so you can practice this when you're talking to people just at parties, at other networking events, with, with your family, just anyone. You can show that you really listen, listen to their pain points, and then show them how you can help. That's just going to make yes. you much more, I don't know, just a much more valuable human. Don't we all want to be valuable humans? Yes, valuable <laughs> humans. This podcast will directly roll into a yoga seminar <laughs> afterwards where Nick and Christina will help you get in touch with your inner self-help persona. Does um, everybody say seriously. Um... <laughs> seriously, though, uh, when you think about working at a small business, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the small business owner. Like every day is a hustle for them. Every day they are fighting to pay their bills, to keep up with growth, to establish their company. And if you think that you're just going to join a business as a graphic designer or as something else, it's not that easy. With a small business, each new person that you add becomes a liability, becomes a new set of bills that the small business owner has to pay. Your bills are now my problem as a small business owner. And so my suggestion is flip the script on that. How can you start off as an asset to that small business owner? How can you start and say, uh, look, I'm willing just to show up and just to kind of help for, for me that like I do museum tours. And if 
when we post for hiring new tour guides, we have over a hundred, sometimes 200 applicants. If someone were to say, look, I just want to show up and help you with name tags and late arrivals and just get to know what you do. I will do anything you want. I'll just be a spare set of hands. That person would immediately jump to the front of the line. They would get FaceTime with me. Uh, wow. It would be a true help to my business. You're trying to say as a job seeker, how can I hustle to make that person's life easier? Uh, how can I help to make them make money or to grow their business? You'll get to doing the stuff that you've been going to school for eventually, but be willing to answer the phones to get your foot in the door. That is perfect advice. Before we wrap up this podcast, do you have any little tips or last tips for people? What can people implement right now that is going to help them with this hustle, with this approaching people and, and getting their foot in the door? I would say that you should first identify uh, small businesses that are that seem fun and that seem like they're growing that you wouldn't mind giving some free time to get your foot in the door to. First, identify those, make a list of a couple of those. And then I would say second, spend about an hour or two each and make a cool graphic or make something for them. And or a then, video. Or an awesome <laughs> video. And then I would say tweet it at them or somehow get it to them. Send it to them. You can do the email if they don't use email, but hopefully they, they use Twitter and, and just kind of tweet them something cool. Do something once you've identified your list of companies to add value to their business and do not be shy. Do not worry that, oh, this isn't perfect. Literally, if someone were to scribble down on a napkin, museums are f***ing awesome and tweet it at me, I would probably retweet that because <laughs> that is awesome. Very cool. All right. So it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple. It just takes a little bit of creativity and thinking outside the box, which I know you have in you. Everyone listening, I know you have it. So you can do it. You can do it during the, uh, you do it during the ad breaks of your next TV show. That you, that you watch. Yes. Minor caveat, I just want to say, um, I hope that I don't leave my very first podcast by saying, Nick Gray did a podcast and he told recent grads to write swear <laughs> words on napkins. Well, what's, wrong, saying, what's wrong with that? <laughs> the advice that I'm trying to do is just to say, look, you need to one, feel the pain of a small business owner. Uh, to try to figure out how to make their life better and easier because if you can start doing that, it's the foot in the door to creating the, your dream job there. And three, how do you cut through the noise? What are little hacks that you can do to get you to stand out? Um, and I believe that the way to do that is to immediately add value to them instead of trying to take value by saying, will you hire me? Perfect. Okay, Nick. Well, for all the people who are now about to get out a napkin and scribble profanities on it, where can they tweet that to? <laughs> where, can, <laughs> where can they tweet? My business is called Museum Hack. Uh, you can find us on the internet at museumhack.com. I kindly request that you not tweet too many profanities <laughs> at us. I, am, I love to tweet back to people. So if you have any specific small business owner job questions or you're trying to make, how do I reach out to this company? Tweet at me. I'm happy to write back and give you a 140 characters or less answer. And I really wish you the best. There are so many new minds and new ideas from recent graduates are the lifeblood of businesses. And you have so much to offer. You just got to get started. Yeah, that's brilliant. Nick Gray, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for sharing all your wonderful stories and advice with us and all the best with Museum Hack. I can just see it going, going gangbusters all over the world and just exploding. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Thanks here's, for having our podcast. Here's to museums. This is my, <laughs> this is my very first one. Uh, if you are listening to this, please be gentle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Keep listening for the yoga that comes immediately after this. Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you once again to Nick Gray from Museum Hack for being such a generous guest this week. Now you can find the links to Museum Hack and the show notes at designdrawspeak.com slash 034. And once again, if you're in or visiting New York City, go check out one of their tours. I promise you, you will never look at museums the same way again. I'm not, I'm not getting commission from these guys for plugging them. I just, I just love what they're doing and I just really want to support them in any way that I can. Now, speaking of support, if you enjoy this podcast and want to show your support, would you consider donating to the show? I love making this show happen for you and helping as many people as I can and your donations will just help immensely with the running and the production of the podcast. You can donate on the website through PayPal. It's just really, really easy at designdrawspeak.com slash support. Or you can just go to the designdrawspeak.com homepage and click on the link there that says support the show. Everyone who donates receives a warm, fuzzy feeling, money back guaranteed. And that wraps up episode 34. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week for another episode. Keep on being awesome. My name's Christina Cantors, and this has been Presentation Skills for Design Students, helping you become a confident, creative communicator.